Hello and namaste everyone. Today, I'm here your host Vinay Kanduri with this special episode of NBP Hot Seat to discuss on a very important report on India's energy transition in a carbon constrained world. This is a joint study done by Vivekananda International Foundation and IIT Bombay to assess and find the most cost-effective ways of reaching net zero by 2070 for India. Today we have uh, Ambassador D.P. Srivastava with us, who was the coordinator of this task force, and currently he is the distinguished fellow at Vivekananda International Foundation. He has an illustrious career in the Indian Foreign Services and went on to represent the country as the Indian ambassador to the countries such as Iran, Czech Republic, Libya, and Malta. For the information of everyone, Vivekananda International Foundation, BIF, is a New Delhi-based premier think tank, is striving to bring together the best minds in India to ideate on national and uh, international issues and take initiatives to promote quality research and in-depth studies on strategic, social, environmental and economic and developmental issues in the country. Ambassador Srivastava will be discussing the interesting outcome and key takeaways of this very important and much required report on India's energy transition. Ambassador, sir, it's a pleasure to have you on NBP Hot Seat. We welcome you on this show. Thank you. Thanks for having me for your show. I look forward to our interaction. Thank you so much. So, uh, at the outset, we would like to congratulate VIF and especially you for taking efforts to come out with this well-researched and well-drafted comprehensive report on the energy transition scenarios in India. So far, there is hardly any authoritative document in India that has captured the energy transition requirements and implications so well and so comprehensively. What are the most important findings of this report that you can share with us, sir? Thank you, Vinay. Let me begin by saying that our report is not about nuclear sector. It's yeah. about India's energy transition to net zero. Yeah. And that requires when you move to low emission target, you have to bring new sectors of additional sectors of economy under electrification based on clean so sources, which are two, either renewable or nuclear. So as you bring new sectors like mobility industry, under electrification, the demand for electricity will go up. And this increase in demand will bear no relationship with historical trends, which are derived from power sector alone. So the critical question, which we asked IIT Bombay to address uh, in mathematical modeling, is what is the minimum demand of electricity needed for reaching net zero? Yeah. Now, let me add a second point here, that we impose very stringent standards on ourselves. We asked IIT to model 75% of energy converted into electricity with balance coming from hydrogen. There are two scenarios, 10% and 25% of demand met by hydrogen. Now, this is a major difference from other reports. And let me give the example of IEA, which is supposed to be an industry leader and it's much talked about. In, this is International Energy Agency. Yeah. Their global model is based on converting 50% of energy into electricity. Now, and that 50% has to come from most of it, 90% from renewable, 10% from nuclear. Now, the basic flaw in this model is that if 50% of energy is still coming from fossil fuel, there is no way you are going to reach net zero because India just does not have enough forests or carbon sink to neutralize 50% of emissions coming from fossil fuel. So the IA model will not lead to net zero and it will certainly not answer the requirement of energy adequacy. On the other hand, the BIF model, which has come up with high figures of total demand and the total per capita consumption, not only will provide 
for a sustained yeah. de- development trajectory for India, yeah. but also cleaner environment. So this right. is the main outcome of our report and our report projects, a requirement of say around 24,000 terawatt hour of uh, generation by 2030 and a per capita consumption of around 16,000 uh, unit, which will bring India to the level of a moderately, yeah. you know, well-off countries. Very well, sir, sir. Very well, sir. So, uh, cost-effectiveness of any energy source is an uh, important criteria to assess the applicability of different options. To that effect, electricity price to the end consumer is an important parameter for consideration. The report has presented a holistic uh, picture of it by considering various elements that make up the final electricity cost to consumer. So could you please explain it in more details for the easy understanding of our audience? And also, uh, we would like to uh, you to make a comparison between nuclear and renewable. And, uh, you know, the myth is that nuclear is costly. So how, how uh, could you please explain to us that uh, nuclear is basically not uh, really, you know, costly, but even cheaper than solar and wind power? Yes. You, uh, this is the second question our report addresses. The first question was, what is the minimum quantum of electricity needed to reach net zero? Yeah. The second question is, what is the cheapest yeah. or most cost-effective <clears throat> option for producing X amount of electricity? Yeah. And we did not start with any a priori assumption. We gave a technology agnostic choice to IIT Bombay. We gave them five scenarios ranging from renewable high, which was 95% renewable, 5% nuclear. The other extreme was Nuclear high, 95%. Nuclear, 5%. Renewable. Now, these are two extreme scenarios. We are not saying that this is the pathway. But they reflect, I mean, they bring out the, the these are two contrasting options and they bring out the, the different choices available. And in between, there were three scenarios which were based on coal with carbon c- cap- capture, usage and storage. Now, the interesting finding is that if you take the renewable high approach, it will cost India $15.5 trillion by 2070. This is a cumulative figure. If you take the nuclear high approach, it will cost one third less at $11.2 trillion. Now, it sounds very strange because the popular perception is that renewables are uh, are uh, cheaper and this is based on in india's context or everywhere the following renewable tariff you know it used to be a 14 rupees a unit sometime in 2013 14 it has come down to rupees 2 uh, per unit yes. now there's a fallacy here this tariff does not capture what is called systems cost what are systems costs this has two major components one is balancing power the second is transmission what yes. is balancing power when the sun is not shining and wind is not blowing, renewable will not be available, but you will still need, the consumer will still need a steady power supply. Now, this in India's case is provided by thermal power plants based on coal. In rich Europe and America, this is supplied by gas. Now, this is a standby capacity, which is operated at suboptimal level when the renewable is available. Now this, and or not up operated at all in case there's a surge in renewable. Now creating a standby facility which is operated sometimes and at suboptimal level is adding to inefficiency and cost, yes. which is not captured in tariff. Now who bears, who's bearing this cost then? This cost is being borne at present by discoms. Yes. And and they in turn pass it on to the thermal power sector. Now, this, it is possible to disguise this cost or absorb it, though it's not very easy for, uh, for thermal power station uh, plants. But it's possible to you know, disguise it or at a time when renewable generation is just 9 or 10% of your total generation. 
most of the generation 85% is coming from coal but as we move towards 2030 with 50% of capacity coming from renewables the generation will also go up to around say 30% and then it will not be possible to hide this and this cost will not be able to bear this cost because in the the share of the coal would have come down so their capacity to bear this extra cost will not be there yes now get, let me give you a practical example and this is drawn to to uh, uh, one example from european scene and the other is figure from the indian scene european scene in september 2021 the north sea wind stopped the the cost of electricity in germany doubled in uk it went up five times in both countries wind accounted for 20% or one fifth of generation which led to a stampede for finding alternate sources which was mostly gas which led to gas price increase now why five times increase 500% increase in uk and only double the increase in germany because germany having continental location it can draw from the regional grid england does not have this advantage being an island economy even though india is a subcontinent we are much like uk because we don't have a regional grid all all our neighbors yes. are energy deficit except bhutan and their exports are not enough even for one uh, state in india so are we germany is a rich country we don't have deep pockets like germany are we going to uh, can we bear that 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 cost germany has its no coincidence highest tariff in the world it has highest renewable penetration 46% and highest tariff followed by denmark we cannot follow cannot replicate german example now the second uh, and let let me draw figures from the indian scenario there is forum of regulators this is a non political technical body which estimated on the basis of case studies in tamil nadu and and gujarat two states with highest renewables they are both solar and 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 wind that the systems cost which are not captured by tariff account for 2 rupee 12 paisa this was an estimate in 2021 now you add that to the tariff for 2 rupees and you get a renewable tariff of 4 rupee 12 paisa or more which makes it more expensive then coal which is 325 or even nuclear which is 347 and this incidentally does not you know this this yeah. differential will increase because as we move forward because of land constraints ultra mega power plants for renewable generation solar generation will have to be located in remote areas like yes. kutch or ladakh or northeast which will increase the length of the transmission line yes. and the transmission costs so the differential will will increase much more there's a mckinsey study by the way which said which has brought out that by 2100 if you follow the renewable high approach 80% of the delivered cost of electricity will be transmission cost so this is not something which is at all captured in the in the current uh, tariff structure that we have very well very well explained sir so but now coming to the, the you know land uh, requirement issue as you were uh, just mentioning about the ultra mega uh, thermal uh, solar power plants so land is you know a scarce resource particularly for large population and high population density countries such as india so therefore optimum land utilization requires you know utmost consideration by the policy framers and decision makers your report has mentioned that land constraint uh, will be an issue on deployment of renewables could you please elaborate on that renewables are the most land intensive option for generating electricity this is a universal fact it's very well brought out i strongly re- i re- recommend this book for everyone a book by bill gates how to avoid a climate disaster and this is true not only this uh, large uh, land imprint is uh, required for renewables not only is true not only for india but also for europe and us <coughs> so vif study has brought out that for 
reaching the level of generation required for net zero stage, if you take the renewable high approach, India will require about 4 lakh square kilometer, 400,000 square kilometers of land. This is double the total surplus land available in India, according to a study by Professor Sukhatme. If you take the nuclear route, it will be possible to do it within the surplus land available. And incidentally, the problem will get worse because if you take the renewable approach, because what is surplus land today? will no longer be surplus in 10, 20, 30 years as the population grows and infrastructure and industrialization grows. So frankly, we have no option but to ramp up nuclear and many of the European countries have already reached this option, uh, reached this conclusion. Quite, quite thought-provoking, sir. And uh, now, you know, one of the critical issues uh, with going heavily uh, renewables is that India's import dependency on China, particularly for solar wafers, will go up, right? And even if India uh, improves its uh, domestic production, China exercises near monopoly uh, over uh, lithium uh, ecosystem, which is, uh, you know, essential element for uh, battery storage. So it subjects the country to a very vulnerable position, posing a serious challenge to India's energy security as well. So what are your thoughts on, on it? If you can elaborate, please. Yes, this is something which our planners and policymakers have to bear in mind. We have an import dependency on for fossil fuels on friendly Arab states. Imagine if this switches to import this dependency on China if you follow the renewable route because it's not simply the wafers for producing the, the cells and the solar panels, but lithium for the battery storage. Because as I brought out earlier, renewables have so very low PLF, plant load factors, yes. and they have to be backed by battery storage. And the most efficient battery storage solution available right now is lithium. So it will, in fact, uh, increase India's dependency on China, which uh, our planners have to keep in mind, uh, given the geopolitical context. So, so it's uh, important that India sufficiently diversify its uh, energy sourcing and uh, sort of, you know, get rid of the vulnerable positions or vulnerable uh, situations that may emerge in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, an important takeaway of the report is, you know, financial and economic implication of energy transition, as you also mentioned uh, in your initial remarks. So, if we uh, and uh, you know, uh, and if we go for a lopsided energy mix that is heavily tilted towards renewables, so could you please share some more insight on it and suggest an optimum clean energy uh, mix for India for a sustainable uh, energy transition? As I made clear in the beginning, we've given uh, com five scenarios for IIT to work out the cost because we did not want, we did not start from any a priori assumption okay. in or, or conclusion in favor of a particular okay. source. So we wanted to look at all options. And as I mentioned, the renewable high option is going to be most expensive at 15.5 trillion while the nuclear high will be 11.2 trillion. In between, there are three scenarios with varying ratios of coal with CCUS. CCUS is commercially not viable, but this is just to give broad indication. Uh, in all modesty, we have not prescribed a pathway. We have just worked out the costs, and it is for the policymaker and the country to you know, because there will be other considerations at play. For instance, coal involves livelihood for a large uh, number of people, so you can't simply write them off. And if we move forward and CCUS becomes commercially viable, then maybe we can use one of these scenarios. But in any case, the point I want to make that amongst all major economies, India has the lowest share of nuclear in generation, yes. just 3%. 
टू परसेंट इन टर्म्स ऑफ कैपेसिटी थ्री परसेंट इन जनरेशन वॉट इज द शेयर फॉर अदर मेजर इकोनॉमीज फॉर यू एस इट इज ट्वेंटी परसेंट फॉर ई यू इट इज ट्वेंटी परसेंट फॉर रशिया इट इज ट्वेंटी फाइव परसेंट फॉर चाइना इट वॉज थ्री परसेंट लाइक इंडिया बट इट इज रैम्पिंग इट अप वेरी रैपिडली and their reports is building 150 nuclear power plants by 2030 to take the share of nuclear in its generation mix to 10% uh japan which suffered the tragedy of hiroshima and nagasaki in second world war and has a, therefore a very strong anti nuclear lobby and more recently in 2011 there was this uh, fukushima disaster despite that japan has decided to restart its nuclear power program and in fact if i remember correctly they have 55 nuclear power plants and they are going to expand it in case of south korea nuclear is 20% currently they want to take it above 30% by 2030 in 7 years time and the the renewable is 4% now how can india cannot be a complete you know uh, stand alone uh, you know make choices which uh, nobody else has made either we know something which others don't know or others know something which we don't know so we need to ramp up nuclear now this will require state support because nuclear is in public sector uh, so you have either you can uh, we we can come to that later but let me yeah. uh, conclude uh, on this point to yeah. one more issue and that is we have to sensitize the public that these heavy investments required for bringing down emissions without compromising on energy adequacy need long term planning you know even if you don't, don't take the nuclear high approach you take the renewable high approach so let's you know the the investment will be even more 15 trillion dollar yes. so this to avoid the state cannot simply bear this cost on the Absolutely. basis of budgetary resources so to avoid a physical strain we have to restore the health of the discoms and the discoms health requires that this policy of free bees that is writing off Our sectors for favored constituency that has to be stopped. This requires political consensus, Absolutely. and we also have to prepare public for increase in in the tariff. The increase in tariff, our study has shown, yes. if you take the renewable high approach, will be three times. If you take the nuclear high approach, there will still be even that route will in, involve increase in tariff, but it will double instead of tripling. so these are things the the cost implications which have to be and these need to be talked about Fantastic. unfortunately many of these western prescriptions are very yeah. silent about the costs involved because the agenda is to hustle us into accepting yes. emission cap at an early stage and yeah. that solves their problem but it will compromise india's development trajectory yeah that's absolutely sir absolutely so but uh, basically nuclear is the missing link you know that connects india to a successful energy transition and uh, also uh, you know will be helpful in uh, sort of uh, uh, realizing india's economic aspirations but then nuclear for its own reasons and uh, constant neglect and uh, conventional centralized nature like you mentioned you know uh, j- just why ago and uh, uh, there is a malicious campaign by wasted interest groups also uh, uh, because of all these you know uh, the sector could not see the expected growth for decades and perhaps now require some structural reforms and growth stimulants what do you suggest on this aspect uh i must uh, first flag the some very major positive initiative taken by the government yeah which was to announce uh, fund you know 10 nuclear power plants now yes. this will ensure continuity of orders for the vendors without which the industry will not be willing to uh, invest in 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 equipment and capacity needed to expand the sector but 
the scale has to be ramped up very rapidly. We are, have, are aiming at uh, 22 gigawatt, which will be uh, roughly uh, roughly about 5% of India's capacity by 2030. This will not do. We need to, you know, China, as I mentioned, is aiming at 10%. And uh, they have more resources, yes. but we also have our energy requirements. So uh, the government has to step in to provide resources to NPCIL because resources are, on this scale cannot be internally generated. Nuclear sector has a built-in disadvantage because given the Atomic Energy Act, it cannot raise equity from stock market. So an immediate uh, solution is uh, encourage more of joint ventures between NPCIL and other PSUs, uh, which, are, which are cash rich, uh, some progress made in this direction. But this process has to be carried forward. We also need to look at the choices made by other countries, UK and UAE, both are rich countries and you, especially UAE is very cash, you know, capital rich country. And what is the choice they are making? They have not in only not only allowed private sector, they have allowed foreign vendors to come yes. in, uh, which reduces the requirement of capital to being provided by the domestic, by the national government or domestic market. And it also acts to ensure some discipline in, in project yes. costs because if the vendor is putting its own money it will in, 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 in setting up the plant it will make sure that they, uh, this is the most cost effective but they in turn will require a long term long term guarantee for, uh, for, for tariff yes. but to begin with I think the budgetary support to NPCIL and encouragement to other PSUs to tie up with NPCIL and perhaps having one more NPCI to, to go yes. forward. And, yes. you know, apart from the funding issue, there's a very major human resource issue. Yes, You can't create this expertise overnight. Maybe a way out, which, you know, taking from the medical field after COVID, Government has increased the retirement age. They should do that for the nuclear sector. And sir, what are your thoughts on you know this privatization and then uh, sort of you know in some form and uh, decentralization in the utility sector? Uh, because uh, as you mentioned, uh, you know, and we have witnessed also, for example, in the solar sector, decentralization plays a major role, you know, for scaling up uh, solar capacity in the country. So, uh, how can go government do it and uh, is there any progress or any work going on at this front? I had mentioned earlier, you know, the decentralization in the renewable sector that which brought in many of the private players and which has helped expand yeah. the capacity. There's a catch and yeah. the catch is that they are only investing in the generation. They are the, the balancing power and the transmission costs yes. are not borne by these promoters. That goes to the account of the discoms and they in turn is essentially is, yes. it's a cost passed on to disguise cost but a real cost but it is passed on to, it's, it's not captured in tariff and passed on to consumer. Yes. Now this model is not sustainable going forward. Yes. Now if you are looking at the that looking at the nuclear sector, I, I just mentioned that uh, we need to bring in more players. And one way is to encourage more PSUs. The other way, which will require Atomic Energy yes. Act to be amended, is to allow other players to come in. But that's a, something which uh, uh, the government has to decide. Quite, quite interesting, sir. And uh, for and, example, and let me let let yeah. me just add one more thing. You know, sure, for sir. the renewable also for complete transparency, I think the future projects should be renewable plus storage, so yes. that it's very clear that it's not discom which is left to bear the cost. Yes. And some of those, you know, there have been green core and and renew power, two of those uh, such projects with storage. 
Yes. The tariff was above four rupees. The point I was making earlier that yes. it actually is more expensive, but that brings in an element of transparency. And there again is a catch that there is no grid level storage solution available. Yes. So decentralization is a desirable goal, but it's it's very complicated. Okay. And the other side of the coin is that uh, the we need renewable and it's good that we are making uh, attempt to increase it yes. but it can best be deployed as distributed energy yes which minimizes the tra transmission costs and perhaps yes. the best application is in agricultural sector where the renewable cycle solar cycle and the agricultural working hours in agricultural sector they coincide during daytime Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. And uh, for for example, you have mentioned, you know, the, like uh, uh, for uh, uh, basically collaboration in the nuclear field, there need to be some, you know, innovative uh, modeling also, business modeling. For example, in Turkey, uh, Turkey, we see that uh, for AKU nuclear power plant, they have a sort of PPP arrangement with a foreign entity, Rosatom. And uh, they will be sort of, Rosatom will be the owner operator uh, you know for uh, uh, 15 years time they will be collecting the tariff and then after 15 years they will transfer it to the government of turkey or whosoever is the uh, 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 utility uh, national utility of the turkey so these are the sort of uh, you know models that can be thought over in the this is turkey is not alone and certainly not the first i was referring earlier to the british and the yeah, UAE idiot. models is exactly the same thing. Yes, yes. That is, the foreign vendor has come in. Yes, In idiot. case of UK, it is EDF, which is a French utility yeah. company. In fact, at one point, even the Chinese were allowed. Yes. Though now there's some, you know, second thought for security reasons. In yes. case of uh, UAE, it is uh, a South Korean consortium. Yes. And they will build, operate, and they will uh, run their utility. Yes. But they need, and they have been given assurance for long-term price tariffs, uh, stable tariff. Yes, absolutely, sir. And sir, uh, now you know G G twenty uh, uh, energy ministers uh, meet is concluded. Now they have come with a outcome uh, document, and they have identified nuclear to play a pivotal role in energy transition. So, what actions you are expecting, or you are forcing, you know, uh, that the government of India is going to take up? And how soon? Well, I'm a retired person, so I don't speak for the <laughs> government of India. But I do hope that they will take into account what the G20 and G20 is being yeah. chaired by India. Yes. <laughs> and very recently, this two months back, G7 had also come with the same conclusion. Yes. <laughs> but it's not the, what the multilateral organizations are saying. These are energy choices which yes. each country has to make for itself. Yes, And one of the reasons is that despite all the talk of international assistance, developed countries have, have committed $100 billion, very little money has come in. So the money has to be raised internally. Yes. <coughs> and that is where the national choices become important, yes. which can only be made by governments. <coughs> yes, yes, absolutely, sir. Absolutely. Thank you very much, uh... Uh, Ambassador Srivastava for this enriching session. So with this, we uh, we will be winding up, you know, this interesting uh, discussion. And uh, now uh, we will go for the short uh, presentation on the report by VIF. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. So uh, now we will be starting uh, this presentation on uh, India's energy transition in a carbon constrained world. Uh, we have with us Ambassador uh, D.P. Srivastava, who was the coordinator of this special task force uh, uh, and leading the joint teams of uh, uh, BIF and uh, uh, IIT Bombay. So we will start the presentation now. Yes, sir. First slide. The energy transition essentially boils down to fight for very limited carbon space remaining 80 percent of carbon budget has already been exhausted by developed countries in china and not only that whatever meager 20 percent remains 
they are eating into it at a higher pace because their per capita emission is much higher than india's uh in 2021 china accounted for 30% of global uh, emissions uh the indian share was just 2. Point, uh, was just 7.2% uh, and this is despite the fact that china and india have comparable population but their emission level was all more than four times uh, that of india yes thanks uh as i had explained the model chosen by vif iit study converts a higher share of energy into electricity based on clean sources now this accounts for will account for cleaner outcome as compared to iea which which is based for converting only 50% of energy in, into electricity now if 50% of energy is still coming from fossil fuel there is no way you are going to achieve net zero because india or most other countries do not have carbon sinks or forests which can absorb emissions from uh, 50% of energy coming from fossil sources but because we are convert taking a higher share of energy uh, based on clean sources our numbers of per capita consumption and uh, total generation are much higher than that of the iea next uh iea report the generation is 30000 terawatt hour the uh, sorry vi vif iit report the generation is around 24 to 30000 terawatt hour in case of iea it is just 3433 terawatt hour one roughly 1/8 or 1/10 of what vif report has projected now which one of the this is true india's energy, total energy con consumption which includes uh, all forms of energy in 2020 yes. was 6292 terawatt hour yes it is inconceivable that india's energy consumption will be half the level of energy consumption in 2020 which was pandemic year when yes. the economic activities had slowed down yes next this is a quote from a from my favorite book yeah. uh, by bill gates and he has brought out the problem with uh, renewables because they are intermittent they require either uh, battery storage or a balancing power which pushes up the cost yes now you know we discussed this that why renewable option is more expensive than nuclear many of the bodies like irena international renewable energy agency they prefer a methodology called lcoe yes. levelized cost cost of electricity now the flaw in this model is that this only takes into account the plant level cost it leaves out the systems cost which include the balancing power and the transmission which i have explained earlier and mit study pointed out that for the same generation which 100 gigawatt of nuclear power produces a uh, renewable with battery solution will require 600 gigawatt of capacity six times higher and this is what this is what makes a renewable option much more expensive than the nuclear option yes if you take the total cost absolutely now we have illustrated the same thing here uh, you look <laughs> at the left graph Uh, which is capacity the right graph is generation the left graph capacity there are two bars the left bar is the capacity required in case you follow the renewable high approach you will need more than 25000 gigawatt to reach net zero by 2070 if you take the nuclear high approach you see a much smaller stack it's around 7000 uh, gigawatt which is roughly one third or less than one third of the renewable capacity required and this is what accounts for lower 
total cost in case of renewable. On the right hand side is the generation and it shows that for roughly one third the capacity, the nuclear is still able to generate the same amount of electricity as the renewable. Very interesting. Sir. Very interesting. This is a land calculation and you know we have uh, converted 70%, 75% of energy into electricity and there are two scenarios where the balance in one 10% of demand is met by hydrogen and the other more extreme is that the balance entire 25% of demand is met by hydrogen. Now, let's take the lower, which is the 75% of energy converted into electricity with 10% hydrogen. This requires for renewable high approach, 4 lakh, more than 4 lakhs, 400,000 square kilometers of land. A, a nuclear high approach will require 183,000 square kilometers. So nuclear high will still be within the 200,000 square kilometers of surplus land. A renewable approach will be double the surplus land available now. And the problem is that what is surplus today will not be surplus yes. in the next 10, 20, 30 years because the population will grow, the industrialization and the infrastructure will grow. So Absolutely. we have a very grim situation. And in fact, it rules out renewable for the, you know, for a, as a pathway to, to reaching net zero. And, and sir, um, uh, just a small question here. The hydrogen that you are mentioning here, uh, it, uh, what will be the source for uh, uh, hydrogen generation for these two different cases? For 10% and 25%? In both cases, there can be two possibilities. One is hydrogen produced on renewable, from renewables, which okay. is what Niti Aayog uh, has yes. announced for yes. India. And the other is hydrogen produced from nuclear. Okay, now, so nuclear high approach is basically uh, no, no, taking no, into no, consideration. Okay, no, okay. no, renewable high and nuclear high has nothing to do with hydrogen. Okay. Hydrogen these two scenarios mm -hmm. both are part of 75 percent okay. of the energy basket which is okay. coming okay. through uh, by you have either of these two choices yes but the 10 percent hydrogen is part of the remaining 25 percent of the energy ah. basket which is left uncovered so it. we have given two variations 10 percent mm -hmm. and 25 percent okay. now let's only talk about the hydrogen production i mean i mentioned there are two routes Okay. renewable and and the nuclear okay. we have chosen the renewable route for green hydrogen all major economies including us uk france china yes uh, russia japan south korea are keeping both the options open okay. which includes nuclear okay. also and why because of two reasons one as i mentioned the renew if you are based making hydrogen also through renewable route, your land requirement will go astronomically high. Yes. You take the 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 the, the lower part, 25% hydrogen, renewable high approach will require 1.3 million square kilometers of land, about seven times the surplus land available. Mm -hmm. So this com is completely, you know, out of question. Okay. Uh, in case of, if you take the nuclear approach, Yes. The cost and the land uh, cost, not only the land requirement is less, the cost is less. Why? The reason is, let me explain. If you yeah. take the renewable approach, first the solar power or wind power is used for generating electricity. That electricity will break up the water molecule into hydrogen yeah. through electrolysis process. So this is the first stage. And in the second stage, that hydrogen will be burn to generate electricity. So there's a two-stage conversion. Yes. And this is a basic law of physics that yeah. two-stage conversion means energy loss. Yes. So yes. final energy output will be 30% of the input cost, which makes the renewable approach extremely inefficient and costly. And this is why US, UK and other uh, Japan, South Korea, China, they are all keeping their options open for the renewable uh, nuclear approach. What happens yes. in case of nuclear? High temperature nuclear power reactor through thermo 
thermochemical process can directly split hydrogen a water yeah. molecule without yes. requiring electricity so this reduces the demand for electricity yes. which will reduce the generation generating assets required and bring down the cost true now this requires development of high temperature gas reactor Ch china claims it has already developed yes U biden administration has has given a grant so has the uk uh, and, and and france and, and south korea yeah hdr they call it hdr High, high, temperature. high temperature gas reactor, which yes. requires R&D for which yes. funding is being provided by governments in these countries. Yeah, and another issue with the renewables also, sir, availability of you know solar and wind because the, you, the asset utilization will be very low, and that's why very low. you know co yes. we will have to keep a, a lot of battery storage if we want to make it twenty four hours, and uh, this will increase our cost abysmally high. Yes. Should I go to next slide, sir? Yes. Thank you. You know, this is a problem. You know, I mentioned earlier, Germany and Denmark have highest renewable penetration. They also have highest and second highest electricity prices in the world. This yes. is based on a European uh, uh, database. Yeah. It, Statista. And I had mentioned earlier the report of Forum of Regulators, which mentioned that the system's cost for Renewable integration works out to two rupee twelve pesa added to the tariff for two rupees. It makes it more expensive than either coal or nuclear. Next, this you know there are three bars. The left extreme left is the business as usual scenario, yeah. where you will not reach net zero. There will be high level of emission. The cost in this case is. 12.1 trillion dollar then you have two scenarios based on net zero in by 2070 and the middle one which is based on renewable approach will have a cost price tag of 15.5 trillion dollar over 50 years period while the extreme right is a nuclear high scenario with some renewable and this will be one third less costly at eleven point two trillion dollars. Uh, we have government of India has not accepted peaking, and there's a good reason because our electricity consumption is amongst the lowest in the world, one third of the global average. But for the sake of this study, we asked IIT Bombay to model uh, emission levels at the peak. Uh, considering 2050 as a peak year yes. and their finding was India's per capita emission will peak at 6.8 tons in 2050. This was below China's per capita emission of 7.3 tons today and it will be far below Chinese peak consumption of 8.9 tons which, which it will reach in 2030. It will be so Indian emission level at peak in 2050 will be one third less than the Chinese emission at peak level in 2030. Next. Fantastic. You know, just to sum up the, to maintain India's development trajectory while decarbonizing the economy, you have to increase a per capita electricity consumption. You know, it's a fallacy to assume, you know, many of the findings uh, have simply capped India's, you know, electricity consumption at a very low level in order to reach low emission and low cost sol solutions. You know, there are two ways of reaching net zero. Net zero is balancing between emission and absorption. You can do this balancing at a very low level and you can do yeah. this balancing at a slightly higher level. If you do this balancing at current level, where India is one third of the global average, it's not one third of US, it's not one third of China, it's one third of global average, which also includes Sub Saharan Africa. Yeah. You will be, this will seriously impair India's development trajectory. Yeah. And that is why we need to, ha to have more generation, and this will mean 
higher costs and this requires government intervention. This also requires sensitizing the public for increase in tariff. And we have to bear in mind that India simply does not have enough land to reach net zero uh, following the renewable route. Renewables are useful for distributed generation, yeah. preferably in agriculture. Next. Uh, developed countries committed $100 billion per annum of assistance to developing country for energy transition at Paris in 2015. They have still not reached this modest target. It's actually, seven, they are 70% below and even that 70% of uh, whatever they have promised is not grant, it is mostly credit or loan. Uh, India has estimated that as G20 chair that we will, that the at global level, the world will need $4 trillion per annum. So $100 billion is, you know, hardly 0.2% yes. or something of the finances required. So most of this money will have to come through domestic sources. And that requires uh, uh, restoring the health of the disforms. Otherwise, the government budget will be strained. Uh, I will also. I would also like to mention that you know there's another fallacy that uh, green financing is available. Mm -hmm. Green financing, private financing based on uh, green financing based on private equity will come only if the tariff level is uh, increased. At present, India's tariff is amongst the lowest in the world. Whether we'll be able to afford that kind of increase, which can attract the green uh, finance is doubtful. Absolutely. And I would like to end by this quote from Bill Gates' book that nuclear power is the only carbon-free energy source that can reliably deliver power day and night through every season almost anywhere on earth that has been proven to work on a large scale. No other clean energy source even comes closer to what nuclear already provides today. And this is Bill Gates. Quite, quite How to nice. avoid a climate disaster. I recommend this book to everyone interested sure, in sure. clean environment. Sure, sure. I, at I affordable will also, cost. Thank you so much. And uh, surely we will be going through this book, sir. And uh, we will recommend it to others also. And uh, now with this, I think uh, we, we will wind up our discussion and uh, we are very thankful to you for take, taking out your time for this enriching discussion sir and uh, we are looking forward to have more of such interaction in the future thank you Vinay. thanks for your time and thanks for hosting me on this thank and you, we Vinay, hope sir. that uh, our interaction yeah. has been uh, will be use is, has been useful yes. to the audience also yes Surely it will be. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye.